Performing heart valve repairs, especially the mitral valve, requires some very specialized spatial reasoning and hand-eye coordination. During surgery, the patient's put on a heart-lung machine, and so the surgeon works with the valve when the heart is deflated and not beating. But they have to be able to predict what their repairs will do for the heart when it is beating and full of blood. And this is difficult because the valve structure is quite complicated. The mitral valve is perhaps the most important valve in the heart. The left side of the heart uh, squeezes to force blood through the body, and the mitral valve has to close to prevent blood from flowing back towards the lungs. If the leaflets don't come together and seal as intended, there's blood that can flow backwards towards the lungs, and that can lead to overwork and eventually heart failure. This is not an uncommon problem. There are something like 60,000 mitral valve repair surgeries per year in the United States, so it's important for surgeons to be able to get this right. As I mentioned, the anatomy of the mitral valve is, is fairly complex. So again, this is a cross-section through the left ventricle, and the mitral valve is composed of two leaflets, which are membranes that flap open and close to allow blood to flow into the ventricle. Uh, the two leaflets are anchored around the edge in this ring, this annulus, where they attach to the rest of the heart. And then the free edges come down and form these cords, or chordae, which are attached to the midpoint of the ventricle wall at the papillary muscles. The valve acts something like a parachute. As the left ventricle contracts and raises pressure, it forces these leaflets to close against each other to prevent that backflow. So there's a complex combination of anatomy that leads to a valve that either seals or doesn't seal. Now, once they've diagnosed what's wrong, the surgeons have a number of repair procedures. They can attach a ring, sew a ring in place around the annulus. That pulls the leaflets together and allows them to seal. Some patients require cutting and sewing the actual leaflets, and then sometimes surgeons will attach cords, more of these strings, between the papillary muscles and the edges of the membranous leaflet surface in order to allow good sealing. And this is very challenging because, again, the heart isn't beating at this time. They have a limited view, and the disease presents in a variety of different ways. Uh, each patient has a specific geometry and set of problems that have to be addressed. Our work is aimed at creating surgical planning systems we first create a mechanical model from three-dimensional medical images of the patient's diseased valve. We then created a virtual reality system so the surgeon can perform virtual surgery on that model, and the system can calculate the mechanical functionality of the repaired valve. In particular, we can test whether the valve will leak under that particular repair approach. This allows the surgeon to try repeated approaches in order to find the best one for this particular patient. The way the system works is we start with a medical image. This is a three-dimensional image of a mitral valve. We then perform a variety of image processing steps in order to create a model. In this case, you'll see there's a mesh net that's the leaflet surface, linear strings that represent the chordae, and the upper edge of the leaflets attaches at the annulus as a boundary condition. Well, now that we have the geometry, we have to have a mechanical valve simulator that simulates how those leaflets are going to behave in the presence of blood pressure. And this allows us to predict what the valve shape is going to be when it's closed, and thus whether it will leak. Then we create a virtual surgery system so the surgeons can interact with that model and try various repair procedures, then again calculate what the valve shape will be. The surgeon can repeat this until they have a final surgical plan. They can go into the operating room with a good idea of what's going to work for this patient. Let me describe the main steps in this system. First is imaging and image processing. We work with three-dimensional ultrasound. You can see here's a volume rendered image looking down into the mitral valve. Here's a cross section that shows four chambers of the heart. The mitral valve is here between the left atrium and ventricle. And you can see the leaflets flapping up and down in this cross section. We use ultrasound because it's fast. It's able to acquire volumes at over 30 frames a second. It's uh, portable and cheap uh, compared to CT scans. It doesn't involve ionizing radiation. However, the image quality isn't great. There's a lot of noise and spatial resolution is de definitely limited. So this poses a number of problems for actually performing the image processing. Here's the result of many years of work. Uh, the first step is to find the annulus, that ring where the leaflets attach to the wall of the heart. You can see in these cross sections through the left ventricle, 
that we're able to nail that hinge point quite accurately, all the way around, in fact, so that we're able to predict uh, exactly where the leaflets attach. Then we segment the leaflets themselves using a, a sequence of image processing steps. The result is this uh, triangulated mesh that describes the surface. And on the right is, is a rendering showing in slow motion how those leaflets come together to seal in this case. Next is the mechanical modeling. And our immediate goal here is just to predict the shape of the closed valve. Uh, is it going to leak? Now we ignore fluid mechanics. We assume that at the maximum peak pressure during the peak of the cardiac cycle, uh, all the loading is on the lower face of the leaflet and uh, fluid mechanics aren't uh, terribly important. Uh, we also ignore local strains. Many previous models of the mitral valve have looked in particular at those sorts of functions. It's challenging accuracy requirements and we don't actually need it. Now, there are two different functions we need here in terms of simulation. First, we need to accurately predict what the shape of the valve will be so we know whether it leaks or not. And second, we need to have a fast version of the simulation so we can allow the user to interact with the valve and perform the diagnosis and uh, repair procedure. So we've created two different simulation engines. One uses a finite element method, in particular a large deformation membrane formulation. And then the other approach is a mass spring mesh model borrowed from computer graphics. Uh, we find that we get about 10 times faster performance with the mesh spring model, but we get several millimeters of greater error. So we're able to use the mass, mass spring mesh models for the interaction phase and then switch to the finite element method once the repair has been created to predict its uh, uh, shape and whether it will leak or not. Here are some examples. These are images of the valve when it's open and blood would be flowing from the uh, left atrium into the ventricle. And here's one of them where we now apply the pressure to the lower surface and the cords and the leaflets together determine the final shape. And you can see that one seals pretty well. Here's a, a second valve and here's a third valve. And this is uh, about real time uh, execution. Now, we can then compare our predicted closed shape when it's pressurized to the actual closed shape when the valve is pressurized, taken again with another set of medical images. And here you can see we get very good agreement between the predicted and the actual shape. Its average uh, error is uh, under a millimeter in all cases. The peaks are a little higher, but they're limited to a few regions within the valve. And then finally, we need a user interface no surgeon is going to interact with these models the way a, a graduate student can. Uh, it has to be uh, absolutely effortless. And for this, we use a haptic interface. This applies forces to the hand. So our mechanical model allows us to simulate uh, how the valve would respond if the surgeon were to poke at it as they try to do these modifications. Here's a, a, what the system looks like from the surgeon's point of view. There's the haptic interface, which again, the surgeon moves around as a stylus. They can feel the forces of interaction. And then here's the graphical display. Let me run this movie that gives a demonstration of the system. The user can move the image around. That white stylus is uh, a representation of where the user is moving. They can poke and feel the resistance. Uh, flip the valve over, you can see the chordate locations. And now the surgeon can come in and do a variety of modifications. For example, in this case, they're going to come in and uh, touch one of the chordae to select it. And then they can change the length. They could shorten it or lengthen it as they would in surgery using uh, a piece of suture. Now, we realize that in addition to surgical planning, this can be a great system for training, in particular for training valve analysis, the first phase of repair where the surgeon has to diagnose during surgery exactly what's wrong so they can go ahead and do the right thing for make the valve work better. And the way this is done is with a hook-shaped instrument. You can see that's put between the two valve leaflets and they tug along the edge to determine what's loose, what's tight, where the leaflets will meet and where they won't. In our system, we simulate this by showing the trainee the uh, valve in the open state. They can move around the haptic interface, apply this point, and grab the edge of the leaflet. Then they can pull up on it to determine the length of the cords and where this will go, just as they would during the actual surgery. Now, in order to determine how well they're able to diagnose what's going on, we ask them to compare their impression of what this valve will look like when it's closed to four different candidates. 
And these range from an example here, number two, where there's very good sealing, up to number four here, where you can see there are a lot of leaks. And so they have to determine which one of these represent the actual state here uh, of this valve when it's uh, full of blood. Well, before you use a training system, it's important to verify that you're able to discriminate the skill you're trying to determine. And for this, we used uh, third-year medical students and compared them to practicing cardiac surgeon. So the medical students are third-year students. They've had a class in cardiac pathophysiology, and they've completed the gross anatomy lab where they've dissected a heart. So they have a reasonable knowledge. However, when we ask them to compare the state of the valve to uh, what it will look like when it's pressurized, you see they were really guessing. They got 25% correct out of four choices. Surgeons, on the other hand, who uh, are familiar with this technique, were able to use the system and get roughly two-thirds correct. So it's clear there's uh, information present in the system once they know how to use it. Now, one interesting outcome here is that the medical students did this pretty quickly. They took about 100 seconds on average where student surgeons use the full 180 seconds that were allocated. And the, the difference is the medical students didn't know what they were doing. Extra time didn't help. They poked around a while and then made a guess. Surgeons, on the other hand, could make use of that time and, uh, and probably more time to raise their uh, predictive accuracy even higher. Okay, then we actually looked at training and we compared the traditional initial training that uh, uh, prospective surgeons received, namely uh, a textbook, Carpentier's Reconstructive Valve Surgery, which is the gold standard textbook in the area. And they compared that to simulation, our system, which I uh, described earlier. Now we compared three different kinds of training. First, no training, just as we did in that uh, first uh, validation trial, to traditional training, meaning the textbook, to simulation training. And as you can see, the lack of training and traditional training were almost the same, not much better than random chance whereas simulation training uh, raised the success rate uh, considerably, not quite as high as the practicing surgeons, but much better than if you've only seen a textbook. Uh, the completion time also scaled. Uh, if you had no training, you just poked around a while, had no idea what you were doing. If you had some training, you had some idea what was going on, but you didn't really know how to do it, whereas the simulation training, you took longer and came up with higher predictive accuracy. Now, one important question with this kind of virtual training system is ask if it has actual transference to the real world. And to do this, we had three porcine hearts that were modified by a surgeon to create specific pathologies, specific problems with the mitral valve. So the trainees, again, uh, explored and then diagnosed this according to one of three states. The leaflets were tethered so that they didn't come up high enough to meet. They were prolapsing, that is, they went too high and leaked, or it was their normal leaflet motion. And we compared the case where students got traditional training and then some additional training time. You can see they weren't much better than random chance, whereas the students who got traditional training followed by simulation training did much better after they had the simulation training, which uh, you know, conveys the fact that the training in the virtual simulator does transfer over to working with real physical hearts. So what are the implications for training? Traditional instruction using non-interactive media like reading and lectures has limited uh, uh, validity, limited benefit. Uh, then typically trainees would go and spend several years in an apprenticeship model working as a resident and then a fellow under the attending surgeon. They very slowly come up to speed and really see a number, limited number of cases uh, across their training. This is unfortunate because surgical volume is a strong predictor of the success of these procedures uh, according to a number of studies. Now, many practicing cardiac surgeons, especially at community hospitals, have limited mitral valve repair caseloads. They may see only a few a month. Most of their surgeries are for cardiac bypass and other sorts of procedures. So this makes it challenging for them to maintain this complex skill base uh, with uh, relatively little ongoing exposure. And this suggests that this kind of simulation-based training promises to not only improve uh, the skill set of new surgeons, but also could help with skill retention in mitral valve repair uh, across a surgeon's career. So I'd like to uh, be sure to acknowledge the PhD students, Rob Schneider, Peter Hammer, and Neil Tenenholtz, who performed uh, most of the work that I've described. Also, our collaborators at Children's Hospital Boston, particularly Pedro Del Nido, Chief of Cardiac Surgery there,